Yes, I'm Franklin. I'm thoroughly thoroughly And uh, at least uh, that's what I'm told. And um, I've been working in procurement for yeah, 15 or so years. I went to the Akimo West Primary School, Tower Hill. And then I went to secondary school, Prince of Wales, to the fifth form. Then I did sixth form at St. Edwards. Then I went to Thoroughway College. Well, I got my Bachelor of Arts, honors in English, after four years. And then I became a lecturer in the university, um, in Thoroughway College, for four years. And I, and I left. That's something we'll also discuss. And um, soon after, I joined the World Bank funded project in Sierra Leone. In 2007, I left the country to take up consultancy work, and I've worked in, in several countries. In, I've worked in three countries in West Africa, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Nigeria, seven co countries in East and Southern Africa, um, Kenya, Egypt, Namibia, South Sudan, Zambia, um, Mauritius, Mozambique, worked in two countries in Europe, Italy and UK, and then Philippines, for which I just did a four-year stint, and now um, the United States. I am, um, it would make it quite interesting if I could come here and give you a typical rags to riches story, but I, I don't exactly have that. Um, didn't have any rags. <coughs> uh, I do come from humble beginnings. My, my parents were ordinary, um, ordinary middle class folk and um, I do not consider myself to be wealthy at all but I am rich because I think a function of being rich has to do with your soul how elevated your spirit is I think a function of being rich has to do with how fulfilled you find your life is and I find my life has been very fulfilled and I thank, I thank God for that procurement is the business of acquisitions. It's the business of acquiring goods, works, and services. And the important thing, using laid down processes, practices, procedures, and principles. And it covers, it covers a whole plethora of other certain types of work. Includes supply chain, value chains, include quality management, includes lean systems, lean management systems, includes just-in-time Kanban, Kaizen systems, continuous improvement. It all goes across all the plethora there, including logistics too. So um, that is what I do. And I started it here in UNAMSO in, in the year 2000. And I was very playful and I remember when my dad that my mom said to me, okay, so here it is. I'm a housewife, I do not work, and I'm gonna pay your fees. I'm gonna struggle to pay them. So there it is. I'm not going to ask you to study. I'm not going to ask you to read. I don't know what you're reading. If you like, do you. Just jump around. If you like, be serious. And um, uh, I remember at that point, I actually I had to think about this and figure out, okay, what, what, what am I, what am I going to do? Then I was in form three or form four at the at principals. So from there on, I had had to start realities. I'm the last of seven children, and um, yeah, my mom and dad, and I had to figure that out. And uh, we, we come from quite large family, and um, um, you have mentors in the family. You have people who advise you on what to do, but they're not going to worry about your academic outreach. So yes, so. While I was in UNAMSO, I was here for three years, I actually left at, uh, in 2003, and I had basically what you would call no reason for leaving, except that I was bored. The procurement system that the United Nations uses is one of the best in the world, especially when you start to use it. And everything, a lot of it is automated. It has a perfect system, online system that you use. And the problem I had was that I couldn't make any decisions. And it's not that I wanted to make decisions. The issue was, for me, that there was nothing outside the box that I can apply my brain to. So if you exchange me for another person, you still get the same output. And the UM system was set like that to protect them from risk. 
which I understand. But I got, I got quite bored with it. And when I actually left, I hadn't gotten a job, but I was going to leave. I didn't have problems with anyone in my office. And I just had a problem with the job not allowing me to think outside the box. Even the reports that we wrote, the format was so etched in that you couldn't actually just slide off the paragraph. It's like, no, come back in. Right? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, yes, well, so that was the reason I left. And I got a job one month after, which my boss in Unamsil found for me outside Unamsil. And I started on that. And it was interesting. I was doing something different. I was doing something I enjoyed. It was the same procurement, but this one was a bit left loose with a lot of principles and not much processes. And you have to apply sound judgment and figure it as you go ahead. So when you, when you think about this, when you find yourself in a job that you do not enjoy, you have to figure this out. Do I need to stay here? It doesn't give you any reason to start making hasty decisions, but you have to figure this out. Are you a fixture in the office? Are you of any strategic uh, um, capacity? Can you be strategic or you are statistic? You need to move from this point. Your life is yours. Your life is yours to figure out what's going to happen to you. We have what we call the minimalist theory. Minimalist as design is a perfect theory. It says if you see, if you see the new um, designs in hotels, in offices, it says that you need less furniture but then you still get good view, good air, and all that. Now, when it comes to work, a minimalist theory doesn't exactly work. A minimalist theory in work is you sitting in the office and doing exactly what you're supposed to do. Staying within your comfort zone, within your contract every day, making sure that all the work you're doing, specifically what's in this, this, this is not part of my work, this, this. Have you known anyone to do work just inside their contract. Think about it. How limited do you find yourself? Of what strategic use are you in your office to your bosses? Of what strategic use are you in business? Or once you step outside the office, it becomes interesting. Because out there is war. And you have some warriors who are messing about with um, weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> But even those who are not messing with that, they're warriors and they need to kill. And you are in the war path. And you don't need to mess about with weapons of mass destruction, but you need to match that war path. And we have a disconnect sometimes with our brain and our bodies, because our brain tells us, yes, let's do it. This always happens at night. And the money you give, let me just go to work. <laughs> you have time to deal with it. You can stop. Time never does. So what we've heard this saying, which says, you can be whatever it is you want to be. And this is an important saying. It's an important adage in life, in work, in at home. You can be what you want to be. Well, this talk we're having right here is about the truth. Brass tacks. Let's be straight with each other. You know you can't be what you want to be, right? Just anything that you want to be. That's a lie. You never passed mathematics in school. You're never going to be a, 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 a nuclear physicist. <laughs> your percentage in physics was so disparate. None of your kids have ever heard that you discuss physics. You're not going to be a physicist. Do not think you can be whatever it is you want to be. That doesn't work. You may have one career callings. There are more than one, there's more than one thing that you could do. And you can do that one thing, some of them, or several of them. And actually, by the time you're 22, you actually know deep down the things that you could do. The only thing is you haven't moved on any of them. So forget about whatever you want to be and focus on the things that you can be in the first place. It's not about other people, it's about you. 
The most important thing that you have to figure out in everything is people. And you have to figure out how people work with you and how you function with people. Because in your life, you have one star player. One. The person in the mirror. That's your star player. You have people you love, people who love you, and people who you think love you. <laughs> but the most important thing is your star player. And the people who love you, the people who really matter in your life, the people in your nuclear family, love you because of what they believe you can achieve for yourself or for them. That's what makes you so great. So the most important person in your life is you. The most destructive person in your life is you. You stand in the way of you constantly. It's not, not other people, it's you. You work in an office, it doesn't matter whether you work in an office or not, or outside an office. There are people who you're not just going to work with. Doesn't mean anything is wrong with you, anything is wrong with them. They are not particularly your enemies. You're just not going to work with you. Actually, think how joyous would you find it if you work in an office where everyone likes you? <laughs> anyway, think about it. You are the whopper, so some people will not like you. So you will not like some people too. You don't need reasons, you just don't like them. Sometimes someone asks, why do you like I don't know. Just not into him or oh. But you have to figure this out. The people who do not like you, and because you feel that everyone should like you, it becomes an affront to you. So you waste time trying to deal with them, trying to swipe them. trying to, to get under their skin, and you waste time on the most important person, you, and what you need to get to. as a punishment to them, that's time for you to focus on you, on what you can do, how you can move. People, you have to figure out who are your people, your peeps. Man is not known by the company he keeps, he's known by the company he avoids. <laughs> you, may be, you may be blessed with a good brain, and you can actually go into anything, and you can scrape off a lot of degrees. They don't mean much if you can't figure the rest of the things out. If you can't work with anyone, you can't work. The work doesn't get done. No matter how brilliant you are. And the most important person to be honest to is you. Lie but never to yourself. If you work in an environment and you have a problem with everyone, you are the problem. That's what it is. So do some soul searching and trying to figure, okay, oh I can work with these others, but I can't work with these others. And move. Focus. Because I'm going to tie all of them together. Either they come from humble beginnings and or they've suffered heavy adversity. That your little problem is actually a tiny problem. You are not defined by things that stand in your way. You are defined by how you deal with them. One of the things that, that is important in programming is the concept of continuous improvement. It's a business concept, but it's a business concept you can apply to everything. There are few innovators in this world. No one is asking you to be an innovator. If you're great, yes, you can be an innovator. All you're being asked, all that is required of you is continuous improvement which means putting one foot ahead of the other every single day. When you 
you sit in the office and you have a process, when you sit in your office and you have a report, when you sit in the office and you have a document, I apply this all each time, when you work with that document for the third time, do you see anything that you can improve? Continuous improvement, baby steps moving forward. Innovation is big leaps. Oh, you don't need that. That may even confuse you. Continuous improvement. And it is everywhere around you. Everywhere. The phones you use. Do you know these guys have innovations? They do. But sometimes they deliberately follow continuous improvement. So they do an iPhone 6. And they put a little thing, it's iPhone 7. Continuous improvement. The Japanese call it quality circles, Kaizen. They don't move each time. How do you do with that? You may stagnate, and people may actually be causing your stagnation. But if you stay in that stagnation, that's on you. That you were born poor is an accident. That you die poor is a death. Inhumanity caused by you. Thank you very much. So it doesn't matter what you're doing. You don't even have to be an academic or be in the academic arena. Whatever it is you do, you owe it to yourself, the people who care about you, this world, to move a tiny step each time. To learn every day from people you even think are strength a difference. And two, whether that difference is a positive difference. Or you can make a negative difference, you know that, right? But you have to figure out whether you're going to make a positive difference or a negative difference. Reference. Who is your reference point? <coughs> People were saying here they have different uh, reference points. Nothing with the King, Nelson Mandela. Who is your reference point? But who is your near reference point? You see, when you have great people like MLK and Martin Luther King, those are the distant reference points. You don't know them, they don't speak to you. Who is near you that you believe can speak to you the way you want to be speaking, spoken to? That may actually be your child, actually, even though you think, you know. But you must have your reference points, the people that make you better. They may be your contemporaries, they may not. So you have to figure out, do you make a difference? Do you have a reference? Are you, and I'm not talking about your type of job. I'm not talking about your type of job, I'm talking about what's in your head. Are you clerical? Are you tactical? Are you strategic? Not about your job, about you in your head. And how this works out. In procurement, by the legal, uh, uh, um, by the legal run, I could not find any other type of job that has as much rules and processes like I do. And you know this, right? It has the rules, the procedures, the practices, the procurement manual, the procurement regulation, and the act. In all of these documents, hundred percent of what we do is not in there. I tell my students that only forty percent of what we do is written down as much as all this reading that we have. The rest of it is you. It's sound judgment. Every act, every law starts with the principles. The principles lays down the concept of your thought process beyond what is written now. So you can always make decisions based on the principles. And that's when you come in. Forget about the inbox, think outside the box. What, what will you do differently? It's very important. So decisions. Ah, this is an important. Matthew Luther King says, cowardice asks, is it safe? Vanity asks, is it popular? Conscience asks, is it right? So if you're a coward, your question is always, is it safe? If you're vain, your question is always, is it popular? If you're conscientious, your question is always, is it right? What I present to you in the business realm is saying, if you're practical, what you should ask is, is it viable? Is it possible? Is it plausible? Is it practical? Is it something that you can actually do?
So, um, yes. Now, we're talking about people and reference points. Henry Ford is one of my reference points. So, he made the Ford Model T called the most influential car of the 20th century. It took him to get to the Model T, it took him about 11 years to get to that type of perfection. Every day doing something that doesn't work and trying again and trying again. Even nowadays in business, they tell you that you should, the customer is always right, and give the customer what he wants. Give the customer what he wants. Henry Ford, in 1903, disagreed. In 1903, and he figured, uh, no, I can do this differently. So he made the Ford Model T. And he was asked, did you ask the customers what they wanted? And he said, in quotes, if I had asked them what they wanted, they would have said, faster horses. That's what they would have said. So I gave them what they needed, what they could delight in. And with that little sidestep, Henry Ford rose up from the rest. Steve Jobs, the iPhone. He didn't ask the people what they wanted. If he had asked, Angel would have said he wanted the black man with big buttons. <laughs> Even after the iPhone, he said, no, we need a button. So he says, I'm going to figure what you need, and you're going to learn to touch this screen. Outside the box. Give the customers what they need that they may not know about. We give them what they delight in that they may not have recognized. And why were on the point of references? One of my greatest references is Abraham Lincoln, one of the greatest presidents of the states. Now, when you think that you have problems in life, Abraham Lincoln was special. He had business, businesses failed twice. He lost his fiancée, she, she died before they could get married. And he lost elections eight times. Let me give you a, run, a quick rundown of Abraham Lincoln. In 1816, his family was forced out of their home. He had to work to support them. In 1818, his mother died. In 1831, he failed in one of his businesses. In 1832, he ran for state legislature. He lost. In 1832, he also lost his job. He wanted to go to law school, but he couldn't get in. In 1833, he borrowed some money from a friend to begin a business. And by the end of the year, he was bankrupt. In 1834, he ran for state legislation again. He won. In 1835, he was engaged to be married. The fiancé died. In 1936, he had a total nervous breakdown and was in bed for six months. That's the year after. In 1838, he sought to become speaker of the state legislature. He lost. In 1840, he sought to become elector. He lost. In 1843, he ran for Congress. He lost. In 1846, he ran for Congress again. This time, he won. In 1848, he ran for re-election to Congress. He lost. In 1849, he sought the job of land officer in his home state. He was rejected. In 1854, he ran for Senate of the United States. He lost. In 1856, he sought the vice presidential nomination. He lost. He got less than 100 votes. In 1858, he ran for U.S. Senate again. He lost. In 1860, he was elected President of the United States. Of course, when it's just your problem, it seems as big as it should be. But your life is not determined how, about how good you can strive. It's determined about how good you can huddle. Because they're going to be hurdles. You get for Fodon, you get for Dreg, but you get for Grab. You have to. I'll, I'll translate that. Bit. <laughs> 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 All right. So this is this is what that is. 
This is what that means. You, 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 you would fall and you have to rise. And you have to dig deep to move. And if you start digging deep to move, after a while, it becomes a habit in your brain and it becomes muscle memory for your body. And you should do that. And you don't have, you don't have any time. Time never waits, waits for you. There's the past, there's the present, there's the future. The most important thing is the present. The past is a reference point. A reference point for you to focus on the future. If you focus on the past, you will never move from the present. And the future is not existent in itself. The future starts in the present. You create the future. Don't, don't, don't wait on luck. I actually tend to believe that luck is actually a factor of intent. As if your luck is improved depending on how hard you can work towards something. That's, that's what I believe. So you, you need to strive, you need to move. If you're doing, if you're in a situation that's not working, change it. You change it. Because even if someone changes it for you, you, you haven't put anything into it. So you don't, you don't understand that. There's a guy called James Baldwin, he was an African-American novelist. I taught one of his books, Native Son. And he said, there's never time in the future in which we will work out our salvation. The challenge is in the moment. The time is always now. Stephen Hawking says, you know Stephen Hawking? Do you see how he speaks? He says, the laws of science do not distinguish between the past and the future. And um, Andre Marot, who is a French author, said, the true evil is not the weakening of the body, but the indifference of the soul. The true evil is not the weakening of the body, but the indifference of the soul. So to conclude, I'm going to leave you with an analogy. And then I'm going to show you a quick video. I'm going to give you an analogy of construction. You know if you're doing a building. A building has a foundation, it has a substructure, it has a superstructure. Civil engineers in the house, correct me as I go on. So there's a foundation and there's the rest of the building. So, how, and you know that if you're going to build this house, don't, no matter how strong your foundation is, no matter how well built your foundation is, you can't live in the foundation. So how smart you are, or how smart you think you are, is the foundation. How resolute you are, is the rest of the building. This is not different from personal relationships. It's like love. Love is the foundation. You can't give it the whole relationship. It's just the foundation. You need the building. You need the building blocks of the rest of the stuff. So how smart you are, how academic, academically contrite you are up here, that's the foundation. How resolute you are makes up the rest of the building. Thank you very much. What I show you. School, the Prince of Wales School, and we even went to St. Edward's Secondary School. We all did a sixth form there. And I worked with him as recently as 2015 when I was a partner in a firm in the United States. So I know him very well. For, for this but I have one question for this guy. 
where do you get your energy from? <laughs> Are you on steroids? <laughs> Are you on drugs? I want to know today, yeah? publicly. That's question number one. Secondly, how do you manage to stay positive all of the time? Those are my questions. <laughs> all the time. And um, yeah, last um, 2015, we was actually looking for procurement consultants and we were able to, to do a perfect project and everyone was happy about it. I, I'm not sure where I get my energy from. Trust me, I don't do any drugs or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Just coffee. But I, uh, yeah, I'm passionate about what I do. I like what I do. I, I, I revel in what I do. I, I don't concentrate on the financial gains of what I do. Those come. Everything that shall be added onto you. So those, those come. Um, on staying positive, staying positive is actually. There's no, for me, I don't think there's a particular strategy that makes you stay positive. I think it's practice. Young Men's Christian Association, we have a slum program. We are in working slum communities. And I want to thank Mr. Ibe Mercy for those gentle words of inspiration thrown into the minds of people, especially me. And personally, I know him, and his definitely has impacted my life in several ways. Uh, he had been my benefactor when I was pursuing my first degree and also my master's work. Well. Wherein I graduated with a first class degree and in peace and conflict studies. When we came down and graduated, people were saying it's difficult for you to pick up a job. Just need to go to places where and work, where they have a seas of war like Sudan or other places. I said no, I'm going to make my way through. So we started it all with other friends and in the end we picked up job. But as I actually mentioned, sometimes you can find yourself in a position which is not a background. I found myself in an angel. So I have an option now to adopt. And today I have passion for the work I'm doing as a disaster risk reduction coordinator. And again, I've already resulted in my mind that I'm going to build my career in that. But one thing he thought that definitely like raised my eyebrow is the fact that he mentioned that if the job is not fine for you, it's not good for you, leave the job. As for me, I'm contemplating leaving it because they are contemplating to put me in another position which I don't like to. I don't like to. So I don't want to ask, no, he did it, but he said for a month. I don't know if he had some challenges. I may want him to tell me what it's going to be like in life with challenges, especially the context of Sierra Leone. We all know now the types of job that we For you to leave a job, you have your people or dependents behind you. I just tell him that I'm going to leave the job. I said, what is wrong with you? So I want Mr. Ms. to tell me how that will be managed properly. It happened in the tennis court. He was a tennis prodigy. He was the um, youngest tennis player we had. He, he plays like crazy. That's, that's how I met him. And we stayed in touch and followed his academic career. Yeah, I went to see his parents. He's an absolutely lovely guy. And it's a perfect question you asked also. Okay, I, I spoke a bit about nuance, and I want to put out the word balance to this. Because living a job is much like living a relationship. <laughs> See what I mean? Ooh, like that. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> if the job is not working for you, I say to you, leave. But you have to assess what working for you means. Because there's no saying, you may get a job the next day. How, how about if that works worse for you? You see, this is where the assessment comes in. And no one can make that assessment for you. Just like no one can actually tell you how a relationship feels like. No matter how many hours the women sit and talk, that is not passed through. You have to figure out whether this is to the extent that you need to go. Because the other thing about being resolute is to understand that running away is not always your answer either. I, you said a lot about failure, which we did not come to discuss. We came to talk about success. My question is, you mentioned the two elements that tie successful people together, or the common de denomination for successful people is either they come from humble beginnings or they have experienced adverse failure. 
I want to ask, is failure a recipe for success? <laughs> is it another item on the recipe for success? Or are they two sides of the same coin? Are they opposite each other? Also, what role do mentors play in success? Because in Sierra Leone, growing up, it's difficult to get a positive mentor or like getting a, an elderly person to sit and talk with you or guide you through life. Sometimes it's almost impossible. People are walking around the clock. And if you are lucky, you have family who is connected and you have people who know you. Yes, you could have that opportunity. But what role will mentors who have failed also play? Because my question is... Success? I'm going to say yes. I'm not saying adverse failure. I'm saying failure or adversity. <laughs> or trials, if you want. Because this, this, this has to do with extent, if you see what I mean. And it, I'm an avid sports fan, like I said. I used to sprint, and I like tennis and stuff. And you know, when you sprint, this is not like football. When you sprint, like when you do 100 meters. There's sprinters before. If you come, the more you come fast, the more people gather around to get you down. You see what I mean? But you don't know how that is until you actually beat it. That's why when I watch boxing too, and Mayweather is one of the people I like, I'm thinking I want Mayweather to lose to make him a better man. Because what is success if you don't know failure? This is about, this what balance is. What is success to you? And this is why we... So I believe failure is a recipe for success. I think it galvanizes you. I think it, it, it motivates you the same way mentors will do. I avoided using the word mentors. I use the word reference. So we're talking reference points. So reference points can include mentors. See what I mean? It can include mentors. You have a situation where you have reference points. Those great men you know who may never have personally or directly spoken to or with you. But you have nearer reference points. And they do not need to be old or older. And they do not need to be doing the work that you do. The, what mentors bring to the table is motivation for you. You could have a colleague that is that's a mentor of yours without him knowing he is. You have people who tell you stuff about them that stay with you. You may not go back to them thinking, wow, I learned from that. So don't think mentors, and you're right, you may not find a lot of mentors in your, in your community. That's why you need to think reference points. My, my, my reference point sometimes in my kids, one of my kids, she says the darnest thing. She says things like, I actually have to go to the bathroom and break. You understand? And the important thing about this is not doing what someone did, exactly. It's doing what works for you and making sure you stay on the wall path. I'm the last of seven kids. I have very successful uh, uh, siblings, but I have no one in my family who went to college. So maybe I'll, I'll see what my point is. Reference points. But the honors is on you. The mentor is not responsible for you. You're responsible for you. And the mentor is a tool to galvanize you, to think he's done that, I can do that too. That was awesome. But two questions for you, sir. I love cars, so I remember that your small match is box star, if you remember that. So when I now see you talking, it brings out a lot to me because just looking back those days and what you're saying now. My question is out of thinking out of the box, you jumped, and then all of a sudden you notice you made a big mistake, like I did once, and it's almost suicidal. What do you do? That is supposed to create fear, that's supposed to create panic. You know, what do you do after that? You think, I, 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 there's a passion to do something, and then all of a sudden, you see an opportunity, you jump at it, all of a sudden, maybe because of, you did not do your homework properly, or it's integrating that culture into the younger generation. They have good parents, rich parents, so they don't know anything about hard life or struggle. How do we integrate that? Because if they don't have that as part of the ingredient in life, there's ultimately a room for failure because money, 
academic smartness is not everything. So how that on first note, how do we integrate that into the younger generation? So you just have to get up. And the thing about failure is you have to be looking out for it. Expect it. It will come. And it may not come in the form that you want or you think you're planning for, but it will come. It has different ways of manifesting itself. So we need to keep getting ready to get back up. And know that when you get back up, you don't do it just for you. You do it for people who will learn from that you're getting up later. You do it for your kids, you do it for members of your family. You understand? And when you look, like when he said looking for mentors, when you look for mentors, know that there are certain other mentors, like the architect we said. Do you see what I mean? If you're a religious person, and I don't care if you're Muslim or Christian, you, you can communicate with your maker. You can communicate with your maker. I, I deal with that situation every day. Sometimes I have to get my, my son's uncle and aunt to speak to him because I sometimes think I should strangle him. Because we, we can, our beginners don't relate. You know, he's born into, everything is here. I can have a life, you know. And we didn't, we, we, we grew up playing Butch and stuff like that. And everything, we fought for everything we have. So we look at things a bit differently. That's why I tell him, look around you. And look at, look at adversity. We have to keep on trying. We have to make ourselves the example. There's certain ways also you can deal with me. Like I tell my kid, he says, um, I'm waiting for him to say, I want something. I'm like, okay, let's get a pen and paper. This is how you're gonna get this. You're gonna wash this for each place you watch, you're gonna get a dollar. You're gonna get this. I'm teaching him responsibility. You understand? From now on, I'm giving you a weekly, <coughs> weekly allowance of one dollar. He says, what's that gonna, that's what I'm giving you. So let's see when you have enough. And if you can get 50% of that, I can front you 50%. It's not love, but that's love. Because know that before they get out into the world, all they know is you. So as hard as that can be, you have to be able to give them that, that top love, to make them understand without pushing them away. Sometimes it's obviously easier said than done. And the thing about parenting is that I didn't learn before. I, I'm just walking this way right now, so I go by to get by. But the important thing you should know, you should not alienate them. You understand? And you should not punish them unduly. You have to make them understand responsibility by telling them, by being an example, by keeping them as close as you can. Because the things you say to them and things you do that you don't think remain with them, it does. Several years on, you'll see. So that's, that's my best advice. That's, that's the way I see it. I hope I answered your question, Victor. Thank you. He said, you don't have to be great to get started. But you have to get started to be great. And in getting started, there are difficulties, there are challenges, there are portals you have to go through. Now, part of my curiosity, I want to know what has been your greatest challenge or what have been your greatest challenges and how were you able to um, overcome them? We have a culture where we procrastinate, where we wait for a lot of things to happen before we make one step. That is a problem. That is something we have to get out of. You have to keep moving, and then certain things will join you as you do move. I've, I've, I've had a lot of interesting things happen to me. Some of these things of which I cannot <laughs> divulge, but I've had a lot of interesting things happen to me. And basically, sometimes what I've got to deal with has to do with the predicament where people believe that if you're in a certain place, cannot be something. And that is something that I constantly deal with. And um, um, like I said, we're all on the war path. And I don't fight it. I try to show it out. To show that you can come from any place and actually be something that you can be. People get really antsy. And I'm not talking about just a radio in, in different countries. I do, my work involves my work becomes very delicate because my work involves a lot of what we call supervision. Not exactly audit, but just about the same thing. I go into countries where I'm physically threatened, I'm threatened in some other ways where I have to do um, audits to 
to approve certain activities, and I am fearless in that thing. I'm, I'm a warrior. I'm, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. If I'm going to get killed doing it, I'm going to get killed doing it. I'm not trying to get killed. See my point? But if that's it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Do not focus so much on the people. There are many ways to, to, to get to go where you're going instead of getting into um, physical or all the types of altercations. And I'm, I'm physical. I'm just a different person when I'm, you see what I mean? Well, I'm physical, but I'm just a different person when I'm being professional. That's what the professionalism is about. <coughs> you understand? And respect is given in taking. And you will find that some people I've worked with, I had some people I worked with here in Namzil, I had a boss who I didn't exactly, you know, I didn't think he, he, he liked me in actual fact. I didn't think so at the time. Um, and um, he reached out to me on Facebook about two years ago and stuff like that. And he's a great guy. And he tells me things about me that I don't exactly remember. And what he thought about me after I left. So sometimes what people think about you is not exactly what you are. It's a factor of what they're going through at that particular point in time and what you represent to them. It may be personal, but it may just not be personal. Time changes the look of everything. Just put something in your past and see how funny it, it feels. So I think being professional in getting what, you, getting what you want is just the way to go. And manage it as best as possible. I don't, I don't think, I don't use the word backstabbers. I, you know, not in the office, I don't think about backstabbers because it's not, my, my back is not there. You're just doing you. If I focus on the prize, I'm getting there. If I focus on fighting you, I'm you. I'm exactly who I don't like. You. So I focus on the prize. Because it doesn't matter whether the people who will not like you, the people who look at them like, what does this one know? You know, I've, I've to, people tell me later that when you walked in, I thought you were a bouncer. I don't know, so it is a bouncer. Like, who are you going to fight now? Unfortunately, this is, this is what people think. I used to share, when we used to go to trainings, we used to go to trainings, World Bank to send us about here to just pass the time and slumber through the whole workshop. And they correct that view by the time we end. Do you see what I mean? You see, and the thing is, the thing about being um, funny, about laughing, some, some of the things that people who are funny are very deep. It's in there. I, I don't miss anything. But I internalize it and we move. Because you are the winner. Even when you work for, like when I appear in some place and, they, and I arrive in and everyone says, who's going to be the boss? Like, like, excuse me? But that's what it is. One year on, the entire thing has changed. People understand you for what you bring to the table. And that's important. And focus on the present. And I mean actually focus on the present. Because sometimes, even the near future is not, sometimes you, you are at night, you're thinking, tomorrow I'm going to bash his face. Stay with tonight, let's <laughs> focus on tonight. Don't, don't, it's all there is. That's why it's called present, it's a gift, a present. I, I hope I answered you best way I can. Okay, one last one. When they read your profile, you know, everything looked good. Went to the university, then you started working with UNAMSI and so forth. Everything was going from one point to the other. It seems as if it was a success from one place to the other to the other. And when you're answering the questions, it's like, yeah, there are challenges. And um, when you told us about Abraham Lincoln, some of us didn't know the whole story. You said he, he, he tried this and he failed. He, he did this and he failed again. So what I would like to know, when did you fail? <laughs> Not the success. Because you said the recipe for success, the failure is also a recipe. I want to know the times that you failed, how many times, and what spurred you to go to the next stage for you to be a success.
so we go all out of principles. And Franklin B. Messi, remember when he said at age 14 he was very playful? <laughs> he was extremely. <laughs> this guy was so hyperactive. He had so much energy. If he was a schoolboy in England or the US, they would have removed him from the mainstream school and put him in a school for special needs. <laughs> no kidding. And Franklin actually failed one year. Yes, at the principal school. That's what I was going to But guess what? That was like, I believe, the last time he failed in life because after that, he did very well in his all levels. And well, that's just an example, one example. Yes, yes, and I'm sure you will get to that. <laughs> but um, you know, academically, he, he, went, we, he was um, at lower six, and I was at lower six, and St. Edward's. I went to England, and I'll check up on him from time to time, and all the stories from then on was positive. He went to FBC and, um, in the 90s. And when he graduated, he lectured. So academically, um, from my perspective, that was a story of academic failure, and how he bounced back from that failure has been truly amazing. He was one of the bright ones, and we were playing all over the place. I got some bad friends, you know, and in form three, <laughs> in form three, I failed. Let me tell you how this worked out. I failed. And my father, I'm the last of seven children, my father thought I was a genius. And when I failed, it affected him gravely. And he drove me out of the house. And I was sent to an uncle. And by the time I passed that year again, my father had died. You understand? And there was some suggestion that I broke his heart wow. with that failure. See what I mean? Okay, now I went and I went to Form 5 and stuff in Prince of Wales. I went to St. Edward Secondary School. My father figure became one of my teachers, Mr. David Dugansi. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he was a great guy. He told me, let me tell you what you have, what you can do, the way you express yourself, how good that is. You know, and, I, and I got even more serious. And all this time, my mom, who doesn't work, is paying my fees. Right? So I got into college. By the time I got into college, I'm actually teaching in six, I'm teaching sixth form already. So once I finished my degree, I knew I was going to be um, a lecturer and they told me, you're going to be a lecturer. And I wanted badly to have a master's degree because it took me on to the next level and, you know, more pay and all that. And the English department kept on promising me, don't worry, we'll arrange it for you. Now, after fact, my boss in the English department, um, Dr. Spencer, I didn't think he was lying. He was trying with the, trying to get us scholarships. It wasn't just me, about three of us in the, in the department who was trying to get scholarships. It didn't work. He tried, he tried. And then I got a scholarship to go to Trinity College Dublin to do a master's degree. And then the rebel war came in and Trinity College wrote me and said, we can't allow people from your country to come. So the, <laughs> the, um, yeah, the embargo caught me, myself. So this is, this is some of the failures. And when I started work, my master's degree, my MBA in University of Liverpool, my Master of Science in University of Strathclyde. By the way, I found a lady here. She's not only Scottish, she also went to University of Strathclyde. That's what networking does for me. Thank you so much. Still now, I'm only going to glass wager. And I paid out of the pocket or out of my pocket for those degrees while I was married with at least one child at some point, my son. And it, apart from the perseverance that it took you to study, to pay, that thing was almost impossible. At some point I'm thinking, let's just leave it. And obviously you know that if you drop out, what you've paid is not coming back to you. The university actually set up a particular form to be where I can pay monthly because I couldn't. Yeah. And for two years, for two years, I woke up 
at 3 a.m. every working day of the week, Monday to Friday, every day at 3 a.m. That's when my day starts, and I and I, I uh, three a.m. Uh, yes, I I have a lot of energy. I felt I galvanized it. Um, Lawrence, did I give you enough trials? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I tried a lot of things that um, didn't work. It didn't go to the extent of me trying to play guitar. <laughs> that, was, that would never work. <laughs> work. But um, um, yeah, at some when I entered college, um, they told me with your degree, with your your um, your A levels degree, you should you should do law. So I signed in for a month, and then I went in there, and I thought it doesn't have much soul for me. There's just the arts and stuff. So. I stepped out of it, and okay, and then I had always a knack for English, and then I did. You know, and my mom said, "What are you going to do, a bachelor's? In, what are you going to be with a bachelor's degree in English? What What were you going to do with that? Procurement. Now, nah, nah, procurement, I got into by total mistake. I applied in the UN mission to have work. The people in the personnel, in fact, one of them is in town right now. Friends of mine, I know them very well. And the day that I started the job, I went there not to be a procurement officer, to be something else. And they took me to the department and introduced me and they said, this guy is your new staff. <laughs> and the chief said, what are you talking about? He said, that's the new staff. No, we have the staff already. Yeah, civil affairs said, we have the staff already. And the person in person are like, someone's going to lose his job. How? He said, this is the guy we interviewed. But there's another guy working. What are you talking about? Who are you picking up? So this person in personnel took me down to personnel section, right up there, and he says, let's look for the other vacancies. <laughs> <laughs> ah, procurement, they need someone in procurement. <laughs> That's how I got into procurement. <laughs> That's how I got into procurement. Very sorry. Very sorry. Yeah. Us maybe are, are, have that kind of problem. As now as a matter of policy, you know, whenever I have a good idea, if I cannot find one person who's willing to become a partner on that thing with me, I don't do it because it means that something is wrong I've, or I've not sold it properly, like I need to go back. I need to be able to convince one person who's going to say, you know what, that's such a great idea that I'm also going to come on board and be fine that I can get a lot more done that way. So again, thanks to Edlene for bringing Job Search on board. Her website is jobsearchsl.com and yeah, if you need a job in Sierra Leone, definitely the place to go. If you're trying to do what Franklin said, you know, maybe you're trying to be in a position right now and you're thinking to yourself, when I'm one day, these people, they will not see me in the office. <laughs> I am going to call them. In fact, go to the office in the morning and call your boss and tell him, look, I am downstairs. I'm not coming upstairs. <laughs> tell them to bring my things right now. I will not enter. Like, if you, if you feel so inspired that you want a career change, give um, Edelina a call, have a conversation with her. Maybe you want to have a conversation with her before. Um, because clearly we can't all do everything. So maybe you're sitting here thinking, I need to be the MD of the Bank of Sierra Leone, or I mean, Sierra Leone Commercial Bank, and maybe you want to be that, but since you cannot be everything you want to be, maybe you need to find out what your options really are. Um, before you start quit quitting those jobs. So once again, um, thank you so much for coming out. Um, I'm gonna do a quick plug because in the hip hop music community, when you have a mic, you have to like promote yourself, your next album, it's dropping, you know. <laughs> you know, you thank Jesus, you know, I thank Jesus and my mom, for get me out here today. Um, and then the other thing, of course, you know, I'm doing a social media marketing um, course next week. It's for institutions and small businesses and individuals who basically want to use social media more as a tool